there'll be such a massacre that there won't be enough lives to satisfy the demand. Don't forget that a good massacre implies killing at least one soul every few seconds. Scrapland is a 2004 action-adventure game, developed by Mercury Steam. For the longest time, the only way to play this game was either by having a physical copy on console, or by being lucky enough to have bought it when it was available digitally on PC. You can try and get a physical PC copy, but it's protected by DRM software that refuses to work on modern Windows versions. It seemed that Scrapland was destined to be yet another game lost to history, but in 2021, the game was remastered and released digitally for PC once again. The remaster both runs and looks great, so there's never been a better time to check this game out. Let's get stuck into it. If any of you out there remember this game from back in the day, you may recall that American McGee's name is part of the official title and box art. If you've never heard of him before, all you need to know is that he's a game designer who worked on some of id Software's classics, and was the director for the Alice games, which he's probably best known for. And yes, his name actually is American. When I first heard about Scrapland and played the demo version way back when, I assumed that this was something he was directly involved with. After all, his name is clearly visible on the cover. But the truth is right there in the wording. It says American McGee presents Scrapland. It turns out that he only served as an executive producer and had minimal input on the game itself. American has stated that the reason his name was used was basically just for marketing purposes. Mercury Steam are really the ones who made the game from start to finish. If you don't know who they are, they've made a bunch of games over the years, with their most well-known title being Metroid Dread. But everyone has to start somewhere, and back in the mid-2000s, Scrapland is where they cut their teeth. Many years and many games later, following Metroid Dread's release, they decided to revisit their first project and give it a much-needed revival. As far as remasters go, this is without a doubt one of the better ones I've seen. It doesn't make any unnecessary changes, nor do anything to deserve being called a demaster. Scrapland now has widescreen support, 4K resolution, updated textures, and multiplayer servers among other improvements. It also runs well and has very few bugs, although it is still lacking polish in a few areas, which I'll get to later. For now, let's see who our protagonist is and what's going on. Our hero is a robot named Detritus. One day he's out exploring the galaxy on his space bike when he stumbles across an asteroid known as Scrapland. It's a world populated entirely by robots who enforce a strict no humans allowed policy. The entire population sees humans as boogeymen and considers all viscous fluids left behind by them to be on the same tier as nuclear waste. By the way, the world is referred to as both Scrapland and Chimera interchangeably, just to save you some confusion. So Detritus decides to move in and immediately has a copy of himself created and stored in what's known as the Great Database. It's a giant machine that recreates any robot that dies, so it pretty much serves as an in-universe explanation for character respawns. As soon as Detritus is registered with the Great Database, he's immediately assigned to a job, as needs have been outlawed by the government. He's selected to be a reporter for the Chimera Press, effective immediately. Detritus meets his colleagues and quickly gets to work investigating a dangerous conspiracy that threatens all of Scrapland. From the very first moments of gameplay, you'll be treated to the crisp, remastered graphics. By no means does it look like it came out yesterday, as it's still fairly obvious that this is a game from an earlier time, but it definitely looks better than the original version, for the most part. You see, running the game in widescreen forces the HUD to stretch out, which is especially notable if you've seen the original version of the game. But it's honestly not that bad, because the HUD still works perfectly fine, so I'll let that one slide. Thankfully it's good news for the rest of the visuals. The textures look sharper, and the extra level of detail makes the game a little more immersive. The updated lighting effects also help the environments look more pleasant. The remaster itself is pretty good overall, but even before that was done, Scrapland already had some strong points going for it. I love the character designs in this game. They're original, creative, and have a sort of cartoonish quality to them. I think there's only one or two robot types here that even come close to looking generic. You will be seeing a lot of the same robots everywhere though, as there's nearly two dozen different types that you'll encounter throughout the whole game. 
But even then, some of those are only found in one or two locations. The rest are used in almost every indoor environment you'll come across. As for the outdoor environments, you'll see a lot of generic ships flying around amongst the traffic. But there are combat ships flying around that have some more unique designs. There's 20 different types that you can both fight against and pilot yourself. Some of them have a specific theme, such as the police ships, but there's still a lot of innovation here with their appearances. This also extends to the game's environments. Just about every one looks distinct from the others. The city districts have sleek, futuristic designs, with some having obligatory neon signs and the like. They actually look a bit striking the first time you see them. It's cool to have a game like this where you can fly ships around a high-tech city amongst floating traffic. It's easily one of the standout aspects of Scrapland. The other ones like the industrial and scrapyard districts have a more drab and dirty look, but you can tell that they've all had a lot of effort put into them. The indoor environments look equally as great, with each one having a unique look and overall theme. Some of them go all in for the sci-fi look, making them stand out among the rest. However, there's only a handful of both indoor and outdoor areas that you'll find. Granted, they are pretty sizable, but you'll be doing a lot of revisiting over the course of the game, as it seems that the devs tried to make use of each one as much as possible. This really becomes evident the more you progress through the story, but I'll touch more on that soon. Something that caught me by surprise on my playthrough was just how good the voice acting is. I didn't realise it back in the 2000s, but there are some superb performances to be found in Scrapland. This doesn't go for everyone, as a few of the characters sound pretty average. But more often than not, you'll be hearing some excellent portrayals throughout the game. Hi. I look terrific! Tell me about Betty. Look out, my friend! The boss doesn't like us showing any kind of interest in Betty. He's overprotective. You know what I mean. She's a good girl, and smart. Really gorgeous, don't you think? I'm a banker, and nothing escapes a banker's eye, sir. We know everything about everyone. That's our job. Unit 2 and 3, destroy the offender! Did you hear me? You're gonna die. I'll back out. That's it! You blew it off! I've called my friends. Now you'll get a piece of me, and you'll find out what's what. Most of the game's humour comes from these voice lines and their deliveries. The censored swearing also helps play a part in this. Although my favourite character voice has to be the bishops. These are the fruitiest religious leaders I've ever heard in my life. And it's amazing. Hi. I'm at your service. Hi. What can I do for you? Please, destroy the criminal. I'm gonna get you. There is a problem with some of the voice acting that pops up from time to time. Occasionally, the characters will speak unusually fast. It's almost as if they're trying to keep up with the on-screen subtitles or something. I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing that it has something to do with the fact that this is a Spanish game that was translated into English. There's a second problem with the voices as well, which involves the spoken lines matching the subtitles. There's a lot of mismatch between them throughout the whole game. Some of them come across as odd, while others sound downright questionable. A messenger named Troll brought it. The guy's a wacko, and many times gets hung up on things. He came to pick it up a while ago. What is this super crazy bet about? This super bet will take place in a human's forbidden area. I'm sorry, what? It's a little jarring to see and hear these so often, but it doesn't ruin the experience that much. The same general idea is still communicated by the characters, despite the difference in text and voice, so it's not too bad. Luckily, the rest of the game's audio is safe from any technical problems. The only other aspect of it worth mentioning is the original soundtrack. Most of it has a robotic or techno-like composition, while other tracks can just be some straight-up funky tunes. It's all well and good in its own way, but that last track plays way too often throughout the game. It'll show up in just about every area you can go to. It's at the point where it's burned into my brain now, and just talking about it makes me think of it again. So let's move on. There are two modes of gameplay, on foot segments and ship flying. It's roughly half and half with the amount of time that you'll be doing with each of them. 
When you're on foot, you'll often be speaking with Scraplands inhabitants. You can talk to any robot that you see, and you might learn some backstory. Or, depending on how far into the game you are, they might have something to say about events related to the plot. But there's a strange quirk with the conversation system in the game. You have to be interacting with something when on foot in order to choose responses, or for D-treaters to talk at all. This leads to a recurring oddity where you'll be flying a ship, and characters will contact you and tell you to land at a communicator in order to call them about something. This is despite the fact that, you know, they're literally talking to you right now. I know it's probably a technical limitation on the game's part, but it still comes across as weird, especially because it happens so often since ship flying makes up half the game. Anyway, when you're not talking with Scraplands residents, you'll likely be ruining their day in one form or another. Early on, d Treatus hacks into the Great Database and gains the unique ability to forcibly take over other robots. Naturally, this will greatly upset every police robot in the area, and they'll engage you on site. But you can always go to a nearby Great Database terminal and change into another robot there as well. It's more convenient to do it this way though, because this won't result in you getting hounded by the Rozzers. The police scanner robots will still be suspicious of you before eventually raising the alarm though, so you'll want to steer clear of them. Changing into other robots isn't just for giving D-Treatus a fresh new look, as every robot that you can imitate will have a unique ability. Some of them are better suited for certain tasks than others, such as accessing restricted areas, getting to hard to reach places, and so on. Odds are that you'll have to use almost every single robot type at some point during the game. This can be for story purposes, or for completing challenges. Abilities range from things like offensive attacks, to falsely accusing others of crimes, and to stealing money. Funnily enough, three of the robot's abilities involve stealing money. It's understandable for the banker robots, but the regular police officer's main function is to just run around and demand that people give them cash. Wait, maybe it is understandable. They'll do this to every citizen that they encounter, even the tiny stapler robots. I'm willing to bet that you can't name another game where cops are shaking down office stationery for money. Almost every robot will use their abilities fairly often in public settings, so be aware of pickpocketing bankers and ongoing shootouts between the local church and the police force. While there is some combat when you're on foot, the majority of it is done with the ships, but I'll get into that in a minute. When you need to do some close quarters action, d Treatise's normal form has an attack that cuts through any robot for a one-hit kill. The other combat-capable robots have a variety of abilities, from ranged attacks to dematerializing everybody around you. You have an energy meter that caps how often you can attack, but if you murder some armed police, you can steal their batteries which will let you continue the mayhem for longer than normal. When you get the cops coming after you, it's nowhere near as dangerous as you might think. While they're perfectly capable of taking you out, they're also ridiculously easy to run away from. Their sight range is barely longer than a stone's throw, and your wanted meter drains extremely quickly. You can literally go around a corner and hide for a few seconds, come out again, and the officers in pursuit will go off and continue searching for people to extort. A few of the robot types won't hesitate to use their abilities on you, no matter where you are or what you're doing. This is most notable when you're trying to talk to a character to progress the story. The bankers can be annoying, but it's not so bad if you've got tons of cash. Although if you get a cop saying, Give me money, to you over and over again, it legitimately becomes hard to concentrate on the conversation you're trying to have. That's not even the worst part, because if you take a stand and tell him to f*** off, he'll aggro and get the rest of the force after you. You just can't win. If you get into heavy combat, you want to make sure that you've got some extra lives. These are obtained by paying a fee to your local priest, or by going to the temple building and taking advantage of the good old five finger discount. You can also gamble them with some mercenaries if you so please. If you die with any lives to spare, you're respawned at the nearest great database terminal. If you've run out, then it's off to jail with you. But you always end up escaping thanks to the help of a random stapler robot, so it's not too serious. The on foot sections are generally fairly easy, but you'll often find more substantial challenges with the other half of the gameplay, which involves the ships. You have a choice of 20 ships to fly, and you get to decide how you want it outfitted. You choose the body, the engines, the weapons, and the hull strength. It's a pretty basic system, but it works well. So let's go through the process. First of all, the ship's body determines the number of weapons you can mount, the minimum and maximum hull strength, and the total weight capacity. They come in a wide variety of appearances too, with all kinds of different colors and designs. When you've picked one, you need to choose which engines to mount. They each have various stats concerning power and weight, as well as a design that matches the ship it was designed for. This brings about the classic case of choosing whether to use something for its appearance or for its stats. You can get some pretty ugly mismatches going on once you've acquired most of the ship parts. But anyway, after choosing the engines, you'll be able to see your ship's top speed and its boost recharge time, the latter of which depends on your overall weight. 
The amount of hull strength you can apply will depend on how much weight capacity is left over after factoring in your weapons and engines. Also keep in mind that it'll make your boost recharge slower if you use as much hull as possible. So you'll need to decide whether you want a fast ship that's weak, a slow yet strong one, or something in between. If you're not too careful of what you throw onto some ships, you might not be able to get a lot of hull strength so that it can stay in a fight. A classic glass cannon. When you're finished building, you save the ship into one of nine slots. There's also an emergency backup ship available at all times, so that you won't softlock yourself. If you're wondering how you get new ships and equipment, you unlock some as part of the story, and the rest will appear hidden in the indoor locations as you progress through the game. On top of that, there are some special upgrades for the ship weapons that you can unlock. If you want them, you'll need to talk to the character known as the Crazy Gambler, who offers bets to you which act as challenges. These frequently involve you committing theft and murder, but there are some legal activities thrown in for good measure. The bets themselves don't unlock the upgrades though, as you need to complete a super crazy bet to achieve this. When you finish a set of free bets, you unlock the super crazy bet, which sees you participating in a competitive mode against the AI, featuring races, death matches, or flag objective games. The upgrades have a noticeable impact on your firepower, so it's definitely worth the effort. There's a total of 12 upgrades to unlock for 6 weapons, although you can only use one upgrade per weapon. So once you've finally put together a ship, you'll be given plenty of opportunities to see how it fares. One of the main uses for ships are the racing minigames. A big heavy ship with a slow boost recharge is obviously not going to do too well here. Ideally, you need something fast and light. The early game races will be a cakewalk, but later on, they can start to pose a greater challenge that requires you to use a properly outfitted racing ship. You'll even have to start throwing some decent hull strength on as well, as some races will permit weapons, which has the effect of turning a friendly competition into a meat grinder. You'll be doing races as part of some of the super crazy bets and the story missions, but you can also challenge other robots that you come across and bet your own money. You can even legally race against the police force. But if you're not keen on that idea, you can challenge someone to combat instead. Like I mentioned earlier, ship combat makes up the majority of the game's action segments, so it's important to get the hang of it. All of your weapons will consume ammo, except for the basic laser weapon that every ship comes with. The only way to get more is via pickups that can be found around the map or dropped from enemies. There are three types that are used across six weapons. The weapons each have their strengths and weaknesses, and one is so powerful that it poses as much of a threat to you as your enemies. Each weapon also has a secondary ability, of which there are four in total. The laser gun has a gravity whip that'll slow down a target. The ballistic guns can drop a cloud that slows down any ship that passes through. The energy guns drop an electric cloud that jams targeting systems. And the missile weapons can drop a sonic bomb that deflects anything close to it. Enemy ships won't hesitate to use these on you, nor will they go down without a fight. I was a little surprised by just how tough the AI can be at times. They won't always just focus on you and stay locked on, as they tend to play it smart and fly to a nearby health pickup if they're losing a fight. Sometimes they'll just give up and keep beelining between every pickup on the map just so that they can stay alive. Among the various enemy ships you'll fight, you'll be going up against police ships fairly regularly. They aren't overly challenging as an enemy, but they can be a lot trickier to get away from here. These ships are flown by cops of a much longer sight radius, compared to the ones on foot who have the vision of somebody who spends his free time staring at the sun. So not only does the AI take ship piloting seriously, they can get absolutely relentless in the race mode where combat is allowed, as they'll light you up faster than a smoker getting off an airplane. If you get far enough ahead of them, they'll go out of their way to pull a suspiciously human-like move and wait for you further up the course so that they can take pot shots at you. You'll need to make sure that your ship is up to scratch, and you'll need to bring your A-game wherever you go. Just try not to get killed too often while flying an expensive ship with all the best parts, because you'll have to rebuy it at full price if you want to use it again. Losing to a tough enemy multiple times can completely drain your wallet before you realize it. But the good news is that earning money is easy. You can do the race and combat challenges like I already mentioned, which is the fastest method. However, there are some other options available. You can steal ships and sell them for scrap, steal cash directly from some poor sod, or do some mini games. Destroying another robot or ship will also cause it to drop a money pickup, which serves as yet another incentive to murder innocents. If you make a habit of doing all of the above during a playthrough, you'll literally have more of it than you'll know what to do with, as there's only a few things you can actually spend it on, but the vast majority of it will be used for buying and upgrading ships. If you enjoy using them, then you might be happy to know that the multiplayer mode is focused on them exclusively. One of the main features included with the game's remastering are dedicated servers for the multiplayer, but when I checked it, there was absolutely nothing going on. It's not that surprising, considering that this is a somewhat obscure game that's nearly 20 years old. If you and a buddy want to give the multiplayer a whirl, you can just host your own server instead. 
The multiplayer mode only has three of the gameplay modes from the single player, Deathmatch and two different flag objective games. They each have free for all and team variants, which technically bumps the total number up to six. But what's sorely lacking here are the racing modes. It's a bit of a letdown to not have them included, but I guess you get what you're given. All the maps from the single player areas make an appearance here, as well as chopped up versions of the city districts, so there's plenty of variety on that front. You and everyone else also have access to every single ship in the game. You can fully outfit them in the garage and everything, although the weapon upgrades can't be equipped here, since they're only found and used during a match. It's good fun if you and a buddy both have the game, but the small number of game types might lead to things feeling a bit stale after some time. However, the multiplayer isn't really the main focus here, as this is primarily a single player game with a story. So let's jump into that. Following Detritus' arrival in Scrapland, he's assigned to his job as a reporter and meets his work colleague named Berto. We meet some other characters in the opening segments, including the crazy gambler I mentioned earlier, who plays a major role in the story. We also meet another colleague named Humphrey, who's the local grump, and Betty, who's the only female robot in the game. Lastly, we're introduced to Detritus' boss, simply called Boss. He gives Detritus his first assignment, which is to go and interview the Archbishop of Chimera. He goes to meet him, but is promptly kicked out since the Archbishop hates journalists. Shortly afterwards, something enters the Archbishop's room and brutally murders him. Please don't know! Oh! Oh, it's getting hot! It's boiling! Oh, I'm hot! Help! Help! Ah! 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 Not the robot! It's actually a little surprising just how savage the murder is, as the rest of the game's tone seems fairly upbeat until you get to this scene. Under normal circumstances, the Archbishop could just come back good as new thanks to the great database. But somebody stole this matrix from there beforehand, so he's actually properly dead for real. Naturally, this shocks everyone. Some viscous fluids are left behind by the killer, which implies that a human is responsible for this, which makes everyone even more paranoid of them. Detritus is assigned to start investigating the murder and goes to the crime scene to take pictures. But as soon as he's finished, he's contacted by somebody known as... <sighs> Okay, so Deep Throat starts helping Detritus in his investigation of the murder. Detritus begins running around to get to the bottom of the case, and quickly learns that somebody is onto him. Important leads start getting silenced before they can properly help him out. But through his powers of disguise, Detritus learns that the Chief of Police took possession of the murder evidence. So he begins working for him and running errands in order to recover it. This is probably the best time for me to go on a small tangent about one of the biggest flaws of the game. Scrapland's story has pacing issues and is full of padding. At multiple points throughout the story, you'll have to do several missions for a character before the plot picks up again. While some games will still have a sense of progression in scenarios like this, it feels like everything is put on hold until you've completed every single request that somebody asks of you. While the missions themselves can still be enjoyable, it constantly feels like the story is starting and stopping over and over again. This persists even into the late stages of the game. When no matter how serious things are, you're still asked to go and complete a bunch of tasks before you can take care of something more vital in regards to the story. Detritus is practically an alternate version of Yes Man, as he just casually goes along with almost anything that's asked of him. Sometimes it feels like certain incidents occur, purely to serve as a distraction that stretches out the game a little more. One of these actually happens twice in the story, as in, it's the exact same incident, which requires the exact same solution, both times. It's pretty baffling. Anyway, tangent over, back to where we were. During Detritus's time running errands for the Chief of Police, Deep Throat discovers that the viscous fluids found at the Archbishop's murder scene are fake, which only raises further questions. Once Detritus collects all of the evidence from the Police Chief, another major event occurs, which means the spoiler time begins now. Skip to here if you don't want to hear any of it. So the next robot on the chopping block is the Chief of Police himself. He's killed in an equally brutal fashion as the Archbishop. His matrix was removed, evidence of a human is left behind, same deal as before. But now, Detritus is skeptical of the murders. He reckons that viscous beings aren't smart enough to remove a robot's matrix, let alone access the great database. He also determines that whoever left the fake clues behind is trying to make it look like it's a human doing the killings. Detritus believes that it's actually a robot doing them. His boss doesn't buy it and sends him to go and interview the mayor, since he and the chief of police were best buds. It's a little complicated though, as Detritus had to steal his ship and murder police officers with it as part of him gathering the murder clues from earlier. This kind of stuff is common throughout the game, so don't question it too much. When he next goes outside, the mayor tries to kill Detritus, but he gets lit up while trying. 
Detritus doesn't actually kill him, since the Mayor's Matrix is still inside the Great Database, so he comes back as if nothing happened. He does get upset about it though, since Detritus has made him look like a chump. Deep Throat makes him apologize to the Mayor face to face, but he asks Detritus to do a bunch of tasks for him before he's convinced of his honesty. So in other words, more busy work. Once that's all done, Detritus survives an assassination attempt, then goes undercover and does errands for the Hitman so he can find out who wants him dead. The Hitman gets smoked before he can spill the beans, but Detritus goes after the only remaining lead, a bishop who manufactures the fake slime. Detritus saves him from also getting whacked and restores his stolen matrix so that he's no longer in danger of permadeath. The bishop reveals that he didn't see the guy who used his services since it was too dark. <sighs> Jesus Christ. But we do find out that the mysterious figure dropped an electoral badge with the mayor's face on it. Before we can follow up on that, another shocking incident occurs. Now somebody's stolen Detritus' matrix. After going on several missions to restore it, we continue with the story and meet with the mayor regarding that clue from before. This results in even more tasks carried out for the mayor, but Detritus comes to the conclusion that it's not him who's doing the murders. Deep Throat narrows the suspect list down to two robots, Detritus' boss and the chief of bankers. At this point, it's the mayor's turn to get killed to death. Not only that, but Scrapland gets a new visitor, a human. It goes about as well as you'd expect, and he's caught immediately. The blame for the murders gets put on the human, and the official story is that he was about to escape Scrapland before he was arrested. Detritus is assigned to interview the human, but decides to break him out. The human reveals that he's a traveling salesman who's just randomly selling software products. So after a chaotic escape from the police station, Detritus takes the human to his office in the press building and hides him away until the plot needs him again. In the meantime, the boss wants Detritus to do another batch of tasks. He needs to gather data for the boss's database on Scrapland's residence, which isn't foreboding at all. So as always, Detritus runs all over town killing robots and causing mayhem to get it done. When that's over and done with, Deep Throat contacts you and asks you to start investigating the crazy gambler's role in the conspiracy. But before that goes anywhere, we find out that the human has disappeared. So it's time for another sidetracked adventure. After getting him back, Deep Throat learns that the crazy gambler and the chief of bankers are related in some way. Detritus finds out that they're actually the same robot. The chief says that he isn't the murderer though. So the investigation continues. Another attempt is made on Detritus' life, but this time it's hundreds of copies of Birdo that are trying to do him in. His matrix has also been stolen again. This so-called great database is really not proving itself at this point. After this new problem is quickly resolved, the crazy gambler reveals that he's responsible for everything. He challenges Detritus to combat, gets his ass handed to him, and goes directly to jail. Deep Throat now reveals their true identity, and it turns out that it was Betty all along. Despite the events that just occurred, she doesn't think that the crazy gambler is the murder suspect. During a meeting with the boss, he asks Detritus to find the chief of bankers so that he can settle some business with him. But when he learns that the gambler is also the chief, the viscous being shows up at the jail in order to murder him. But Detritus and the gang set a trap, and they find out that the being's body is just a fat suit, and that Humphrey is the real killer. Detritus fights him and sends him to jail. But then the boss reveals that he's the big bad guy. Humphrey was the one doing the dirty work, and the crazy gambler was set up to be the fall guy, but the boss is the mastermind behind everything. That big data library that you helped him with is actually an alternative version of the Great Database that will let the boss control everyone in Scrapland. He sends the police and other robots to kill Detritus, but he escapes to the crazy gambler's place. The human comes up with a plan to stop the boss. If he installs his software into the boss's machine, it'll essentially brick the system and stop his evil plan. But you can't do that just yet. Because guess what? You have a few more side tasks to do first. When we continue with the matter at hand, the human installs Pac-Man onto the machine and fries the system. The boss then announces that he has a plan B. After revealing the Scrapland is actually the remains of Earth and drops the only uncensored swear word in the game, he says that he's going to take the nuclear option. Literally. Detritus faces off against him in a final showdown, destroys the boss, and then flies off into the galaxy on his space bike with Betty. The end. And that's Scrapland. From start to finish, it feels like a truly original kind of game. It's got some great ideas going for it, with the ship flying probably being the most standout part. It does have its low points, which mostly come from the issues with the story pacing, but it's still a nice experience all things considered. So I'd happily recommend this if you're interested in it. If you want to play it for yourself, Scrapland Remastered is available on both Steam and GOG. So that's everything I've got for this video. I think I'm overdue for looking at a proper space game again so I'll be doing one of those next. Until then, 
Take it easy. May the great algorithm be with you. Yeah, you can say that again.